done right and on time. Yes, I compiled all the surveys that were submitted and the ones that have come in late, I'm still putting them into the survey stuff. And you'll be happy to know, or maybe you won't be happy to know perspective. I got a hundred on that assignment. So that was good. And you'll end up hearing about what I did with that data, such as today's sermon. Number one thing I was told about sermons, you want them done right and you want them done on time. A bad sermon starts off with being a sermon that runs long. As you can see on the clock, it tells me exactly what time I'm supposed to be done by. That's the good thing. The bad thing is I'm not wearing glasses, so tough. Um, I'll do as good as I can. No. We like things being done and on time. And okay, it fits with the situation. We like lunch being done and on time when we're ready for it. We don't want to wait a long time for it, and we don't want it when it's done wrong. We want it done the right way. And time is important to us. We don't want it being wasted. And so that's why you'll see a picture like this when you go through most big cities. Just because it's past quitting time doesn't mean people have quit. They're still working. Because for us, busyness is our business. We do and we do and we do. Because that's what's important. We want to accomplish. We've got the expectation we're supposed to be productive. And like I said, when it comes to business, we want it done right and we want it done on time. Let's take a look at it from a biblical perspective. Ecclesiastes chapter 3, beginning with verse 16. Moreover, I saw under the sun that in the place of justice, wickedness was there. And in the place of righteousness, wickedness was there as well. I said in my heart, God will judge the righteous and the wicked, for he has appointed time for every matter and for every work. I said in my heart with regard to human beings that God is testing them to show that they are but animals. For the fate of humans and the fate of animals is the same. As one dies, so dies the other. They all have the same breath, and humans have no advantage over the animals, for all is vanity, all go to one place. All are from the dust, and all turn to dust again. Who knows whether the human spirit goes upward and the spirit of the animals goes downward toward the earth. So I saw that there is nothing better than that all should enjoy their work for that is their lot. Who can bring them to see what will be after them? And you've got to realize, Ecclesiastes, the majority of the book is written, as it says in the big yellow letters, under the sun. The process of under the sun means if all you're looking at is this world and not at God, if all that matters is what's here right now, do we see justice? No, we don't see justice. We tend to see a lot of the opposite. Do we see a long-term impact? And as you already might have known or heard, we went to the beach this past weekend. That's why I'm burned on the top and the top of my foot is burned. I didn't sleep well last night. My foot kept me awake. What's the long-term impact of the sandcastles I built? They're gone. What's going to be the long-term impact of the job I do when I work at the university a hundred years from now? They'll say, Rich Kelly, who? If you look back, can anybody here name the cook that made George Washington's breakfast when it wasn't Martha? No idea. Why? Because when it comes to long-term impact, there really isn't much of one. And purpose. Like I said, who knows who made his breakfast all the way back then? What's the purpose for that person? Who knows? Because if all that there is, is under the sun, it's almost a bad joke. And just to make the bad joke worse, because I was thinking along these lines, I went ahead and looked up what atheism is. They've changed the definition a little bit. 
Now it just means a lack of belief in gods. Talk about spineless. I mean, come on. If you don't believe in God, come out and just say so. Because if you don't believe in God, and as we've already said, there is no justice, there's no long-term impact, there is no purpose, you should be out for number one. And that number one God is me, if there is no God. Because if there is no God, all we got is right here, right now, what's happening under the sun. And the best answer for that, if you're being honest and you've got a spine, is get what you can now. Oh, but we've got to think about the good of posterity. Who cares about posterity if there isn't one? Atheism is spineless, it's gutless. Because come out and say there is no God. Oh, well, I might be wrong. Well, if you're wrong, you need to change. If there is no God, anybody who believes that should be acting out for number one and number one only. Because all you've got is now. Live it. If there is a God, whoo, doggies, you got trouble. Continuing back, or jumping back to Ecclesiastes chapter 1. 12 through 14. I, the teacher, when king over Israel in Jerusalem, applied my mind to seek and to search out by wisdom all that is done under heaven. It is an unhappy business that God has given to human beings to be busy with. I saw all the deeds that are done under the sun and see all is vanity and chasing after wind. If all that we've got is under the sun, if what we do here and now is it, boy, is it a waste. Because what happens tomorrow? We don't know. As he will point out, who knows what's coming after me as king? What comes after him as king is a bad joke and the kingdom gets split. And it gets worse from there. Doesn't matter, he was potentially the wisest king there ever was. Doesn't matter, he had accumulated all that gold because when Solomon was dead and gone, if Solomon is the author here, what comes after him wastes it. And generations after that, it just gets worse. All the Glory fades away if all that matters is what's done under the sun. Done right busyness is just a waste of time if all that matters is what's under the sun. But when we're talking about under the S-O-N, there is God. He desires justice in spite of what we in the world have made of it. In spite of what sin has done in marring creation. God still, in his word, tells us, I desire justice. He's telling that to his people because sometimes his people don't get it. There is a long-term impact. Want to talk about impact? Look at his son. We're still talking about him 2,000 years later. We're still striving to be more like his son. You want to have an impact? Pay attention to the one who's having a serious impact. Christian, it's a belief in the one true living God that isn't me. Spine required. Because if you'd been in class this morning, we're going through 1 Peter, and the answer from a couple weeks ago, this is hard. Yes, it is. And we're not the ones facing the same kind of persecution they were facing. To be Christ-like in a world of sin is not an easy path. Just ask Jesus how easy it was. We know all the good he did, and sin rejects good. It rejected Jesus. This picture, need to keep it in mind. Because we sing the song, at least I did as a little kid. He's got the whole world in his hands. 
remember that thought. Because looking at the passages before the scripture that was read earlier today, Matthew 22, verses 1 through 3. Once more, Jesus spoke to them in parables, saying, The kingdom of heaven may be compared to a king who gave a wedding banquet for his son. He sent his slaves to call those who had been invited to the wedding banquet, but they would not come. Simple first question. Who is the king? And we know that answer. The king is God. Next question. Who is the son? And we know that answer too. The son is Jesus. Next question. Who is invited? And nope. I'm not going the easy route. I'm going the tricky route. It's a trick question because I didn't put down who was invited. Because back then the who was invited was the children of Israel, the chosen ones, those who were supposed to be, supposed to be present, except they all had excuses for not being there for not doing what they should have been doing and honoring the king. But like I said, this is a trick question. Who is invited? And okay, it's a double trick question. Ha ha ha! You didn't expect that, did you? <laughs> because it really should say, who are invited? Because Think about that story. When those who were invited initially rejected, one, king has them all destroyed. You reject me as king, I'm sorry, I am so king and I'm going to show. But what did they do? They went out to the streets and byways, finding anyone and calling them in. When Christ came, the invitation went out not to just Jerusalem, not to just Judea. It went out to Samaria, which happens to be the next non-Jewish group just to the north. And then it goes out to the world. We find that happening in Acts. Because the first crowd that gets hit after the Jews was the Samaritans. And after the Samaritans, it goes out to Cornelius, the world. Actually, before Cornelius even, you've got the Ethiopian eunuch. So, Samarius to the north, Ethiopian eunuchs heading to the south. you got the word heading in both directions. Because the who are is everyone. The who are is the family that will bear his name. And, alright, let's bring this back to where this all began. Done right, done on time. In a worldly-ish kind of aspect, all right, I'll be honest, I didn't do as good as I could have done in my classes. That particular class that I got 100 on, I only got an A in that course. I had a 92, no, 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 I'm saying somebody else's grade. I had a 97.29. I missed the A plus by 7.1. And it bothers me. Not because the A plus was what's important. It's because what I'm studying for. I'm studying for this. I'm studying to be a better preacher. I'm studying to know scripture better, to be able to communicate it better. That's what's important to me. Give me a D, I don't care about that. I care about knowing what I need to know to do better. Because I don't want my failure to have a negative impact on somebody coming to God through his word. That's me. That's me thinking again almost about the here, the now, the deeds kind of thing. But when we think about family, we tend to think about family, including the little ones. The ones we want to have the right 
kind of impact on. And when we think about done right and done on time, are we thinking about the little ones relative to what's in this book? When my kids were growing up and one of them would have a little meltdown, okay, it wasn't so little, they'd have their own major nuclear meltdowns. I'd let them know, okay, I understand you're only whatever age they were at the time. You need to understand the time to start working on this change is now. Because when you get older, it's going to get harder. And when you get even older, it's going to become even harder. Getting it done right and getting it done on time, when we're talking about our children, the time to start is now. Helping them build the foundation for the life they're going to live spiritually doesn't begin when they hit 18. Doesn't begin when they finally really messed it up. The time to start training them up in the Lord is now. Not just because it makes it easier and less embarrassing for us, but because it makes it easier for them. Then if you instill in them the values of being Christ-like now, of being loving, being considerate, being compassionate now. It's a whole lot easier for them when they get older. If what you instill in them is like me with driving some days, because, oh, I am running late and I don't need this. That's not what they need to see and what they need to hear. It's the wrong example. And unfortunately, I'm fighting to overcome that wrong example. Doing it right, the sooner we start on it for ourselves, it's not just better for us, it's better for them. Because unfortunately, sometimes we get too busy to be prepared in what counts. Because if we're so busy in having all the right things, if we're so busy in making sure they have all the right things, what have we shown them is really important? We've shown them the wrong kind of business. What did Jesus say? I have to be about my father's business. And he wasn't talking busyness. He was talking about showing them his heart, showing them the heart of the Father through the examples he gave, through the things he taught. Because if you think about it, when a miracle was performed, when someone was healed, when someone was fed, yes, it attested to the truth Jesus was teaching, it also showed the heart of the Father at the same time. God was giving an example of Himself when the miracles were performed. It wasn't a matter of busyness. It was a matter of heart. Because while He's got the whole world in His hands, it's all about putting Him in our hearts putting him in their hearts. Because how does the Old Testament end? If the hearts of the children are not turned to the Father, and if the heart of the Father, and actually it says fathers, is not turned to the children, I'll come with a curse. And think about how cursed our land is when the children's hearts aren't turned towards the fathers. I'm not trying to make a father-mother kind of comment here, other than the fact that the truth is, when you're talking about broken homes, number one thing missing, father. The example that needs to be there. The example that needed to be there when they were young and growing. 
Makes it an awful lot harder, a lot harder for the mom to be the one giving it all. And part of our beach time this weekend was so that somebody who's doing it all on her own, raising up two adopted kids, could have some help. More power to them. It's put them in their hearts, and when do we do it? We do it now. Done right and done on time isn't necessarily just about when we get lunch. Because the time to have the impact in their lives is now. It's like I talked about it last week, I think. Conversation with the teddy bear. Don't do drugs. Not because the teddy bear was ever going to do drugs, but before the first one was born. I was telling the teddy bear, don't do drugs. Don't date the wrong person. They're going to lead you down the wrong path. Teddy bear still didn't get it, but I was practicing. Why? Because when one comes along, they needed to hear it. One years old, I'm walking the floor at midnight because they're not falling asleep. Instead, they're screaming in my face. Okay, as long as you're screaming, I'm talking back. Don't do drugs. Not going to remember it. Keep on telling them. Keep on telling them. Keep on doing the right till it sinks in. Keep on giving the godly example till it sinks in. Teach them about God, His Son, the kind of life he lived for us till it sinks in. Because what kind of child do you want to raise up? And I think the answer is obvious. We want one that's loving. We want one that's gentle, that's kind, that shows self-control. We can go through the lists of the fruit of the Spirit. We can go through all the positive and say, Amen. That's what I want to raise up. That starts every single day. It doesn't just begin when they hit teens. It doesn't even begin just when they're the teddy bear. Every day we make that effort because in making that effort, we're laying the groundwork. We're laying the groundwork for a life that God desires them to have. Done right means following his standard. Done on time means every day we make the commitment. We make the commitment for ourselves. I'm going to strive to be more and more like your son, God. I'm going to strive every day to have more of the fruit of the Spirit manifest in my life. I'm not going to wait till it accidentally happens. I'm going to try to be more loving. I'm going to try to be kinder, gentler. I'm going to try to show self-control even better. I don't yell full volume at the car in front of me. That's a good thing. But that's taken time and it's taken effort because for a while I let that get out of control. We work at it, not just for ourselves, not just for our children, but as Paul would say, for our spiritual children. Those who are going to learn by our example. Because when my child follows God's example, yes! When my friend learns and follows the same example, it's still yes! Why? Because we're happy when it succeeds the way it should. Because that's one more life, not living like it's just under the sun, but living life like it's under the S-O-N. On time means not too late. If you wait till they're a teenager, it's not too late to get started now. If you wait till the biggest oops, it doesn't mean it's too late to get started now. The sooner you start, the better. 
I can't see, so it's probably telling me I'm close to on time. We got a choice to make. We have that choice to make daily. To seek to follow God better daily. Not just for ourselves, for our children, for our friends, for our neighbors. To have the impact we're called to have. Because there is an impact. We see it 2,000 years later. We see it generations later. My parents raised me up based on God's word. I try harder and harder because of that. I try raising up my children based on God's word. I hope, and when the time comes along and there's grandchildren, I'm going to do the same thing with my grandchildren. Try to raise them up. Even though I'm not going to be raising them up in my home, I hope. <laughs> but I'm going to be striving to have as much influence as possible. Why? Because. Because it's in here. And I want it to be in here for them too. If you need to take on Christ in baptism, or if you need the prayers of the church, you're more than welcome to come as we stand and sing.